Yes, loud music. If, if, if you were in Paxton Street today, you would have heard some. And so I was adding to this presentation. Um, my last month has been a pretty full one with uh, involvement in the Overland Telegraph uh, anniversaries. And then last week I was in Hobart for the Antarctic Festival. Mm -hmm. And so Hobart is one of the best record shops in Australia. And, so, <laughs> and I spent a few hundred dollars there and I'll be listening to them since. <laughs> Um, some context to this particular talk, this is a sort of a, a fill-in for a, a speaker that dropped out this year and it re actually relates to a talk which I volunteered for next year, uh, which is the 50th anniversary of the Todd Street Post Office. Now, as was heard, I have an interest in philately, I have an interest in postal history of South Australia and the history of all the individual post offices in South Australia and the Northern Territory, all 3,300 of them. So it's a, a big filing system that I have at home. Uh, I started research more earnestly on Gawler when I retired and noted that the local histories and my post office histories differed in a lot of places. So I'm, it's an effort to put the record straight. And in a uh, consequence of doing that, I am just finding lots and lots and lots of wonderful stories about Gawler's history and the connections with the postal services and telecommunication services of this town. Now, I'm coming at it from the post office side. I knew very little of the telegraph and telephone side. And early this year, it was suggested to me that, uh, well, why don't you have a reunion of the telephone staff? And you might get a bit more history. And I thank Margaret House for that suggestion. Um, somewhat based on their experiences with the timers reunion that they had a few years ago. Uh, to uh, sort of draw out some of the history of the town and particularly the history of women in the town um, because both of those industries are very female oriented. And so I was somewhat reluctant to venture into areas totally foreign to me until I was stood at a pedestrian crossing and Karen Redmond sidled up to me and said, what are you working on now? And I said, I've had this strange suggestion about something on the telephone exchange at which she became immediately enthused and said, well, my mother was a telephonist in Gawling, you must do it. Hence this. <laughs> so so Gawler's phony history was, uh, was born. Uh, we set it up as a sort of a, a last minute history festival event and, and with the help of uh, uh, Anne Hurst, who's here tonight, the lady in pink in the second row, welcome. Um, and is a former telephonist and she got the drum, drums beating and rounded up a good crowd of people. And from the technician side, um, I had a couple of friends who were technicians at the telephone exchange. And all in up, with you know, minimal publicity in the short term related to the History Festival, I think we had about 65 people turn up to it. And then on the May day we picked was the worst weather of the year. But we still only dropped down to about 55 people. And I was really touched by a lady who rang up at about half an hour before it was due to start and said, I'm really, really sorry, I can't come. She was 90 years old and was about to, and had to come on two bus trips to get to Gawla for this reunion. And she was really, really sorry. She just couldn't stand in the rain for that period of time. It was torrential that day. But, uh, anyway. So Gawla's phone history evolved. Um, Learning from the reports of the Timers reunion where apparently everybody came, drank all the tea and coffee and ate all the scones and went home, <laughs> we thought, well, part of this exercise for me was to learn something. So I thought, well, how are we going to do this? So we set up some feedback forms and asked people to uh, you know, give us some details about their time at the telephone exchange and what they did and how they got there and the like. So we did a bit of preparation for these. Uh, so we hand out two things, there's a form up there which has questions inside and a contact form. It's basically we thought, well this is a reunion, there'll be people there who probably haven't seen each other for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We've had people back from the 1950s who worked at Telephone Exchange that came on the night, but in that morning. And so I just basically provide them with the phone list so they can write down each other's numbers and stay in contact and uh, hopefully they have done. Now the telephone, uh, most of us will be familiar with Alexander Graham Bell's invention and he was uh, of the, the scientific mind more so than a business mind so that his discoveries were uh, first published in the Scientific American and he actually shared his invention with the world and, and really didn't make much money out of it when you consider the impact it's had on the world. So, so in 1876 he invented the telephone there and uh, 
this was his, his comment on his invention, and it was pretty well spot on with his prophecy that you know, the telephone would be something that would go into every household like electricity and water would do. Of course, nowadays, we don't even need wires. So, so just two years later in Australia, um, because it was published in a scientific journal, those journals arrived in the mail, and uh, the local boffins started thinking, well, I don't think we can make one of these here, and they did. So here in South Australia, Charles Todd, who I'm sure everybody has heard of in the last month with the Overland Telegraph anniversary. Um, the Overland Telegraph was to Charles's greatest achievement, uh, and I use my music equivalent here. The Overland Telegraph was Charles Todd's one-hit wonder, but his career went for 65 years as a public servant in this state. He actually changed the law so he could continue working past the mandatory retirement age. Such was his value to the state. So he, he is a, a mammoth in South Australia's history, but not recognised as such. However, I digress. Um, he started to arrange for telephones to be made here in Adelaide. Uh, A.W. Dobby was a company that is, is still be familiar with many people today. They were making telephones early on. And his own workshops staff were making telephones as well. So this is just in two years after it was invented. And to demonstrate the product, um, he arranged for demonstrations between significant South Australian towns back here in Adelaide. And so the first demonstration, as was mentioned there, was between Adelaide and Semaphore and Kapunda. And uh, had a similar demonstration then between Adelaide and Gawler, 28th of February, 1878 which was still a few years before the telephone service came to Gawler. Uh, these events were known as Todd's seances because people at one end could hear the voices of people at another place, so it was somewhat strange for them. And they used to do funny things like, you can see at the front there, a lady playing the piano and singing, and basically giving a concert, so she may be performing in Adelaide, and they'll be listening to her in Kapunda. And, and that's the way these demonstrations work. Which also means that they must have had a pretty good amplification system and a good microphone system in these places for the people to all crowd in a room and hear from a simple, simple amplifier what was being said or being played. Uh, like everything, norms had to be made to control <coughs> these, these new experiments. So South Australia had a telephone act as early as 1881, and there's a copy of the front page one there. And this set the rules for establishing both telephones and telephone lines. And uh, one of Todd's famous quotes when he uh, retired was that he left the state well posted, <laughs> uh, which of course both meant and, and connected between these, the mails and all the telegraph and telephone posts that were struck all over the state <coughs> and all over Australia. Now, they were always looking to the, the best equipment to use around the world, that, that's all of the uh, postal administrations in Australia, and Todd was no exception. So he actually had some of his staff uh, look at what was coming out of America and what was coming out of Britain and Europe. And in his 1893, 1895 report and his 1884 reports, he talked about the telephone, and these were the four pieces of kit that were favoured by the South Australian telephone department as it became. Um, we have a Blake's transmitter, which is which is the, the microphone, the magneto call box, so that's one of those where you turn the handle and it builds up a charge to create electricity to send the messages along. Uh, Swiss and Pony Crown, so that's two different companies, a Swiss one and Pony Crown is another one. So that's actually the, the earpiece. And the Western Electric switchboard, which is there on your far right, um, to connect the different telephones to each other um, at uh, each end. So there are pictures of those types of equipment. What precisely Gawler had, I've yet to determine. I just, just, just have not found that yet. But, uh, I'll keep looking. Now in 1883, remember there was a facility in the Act for private lines to be erected. And the private line was actually erected between the two flour mills, uh, the Victoria Mill and the Union Mill. So we have the mill here just north of the Gawler Railway Station and for our mill there by the South Parra Bridge. And I've put in the red line the route that it, that it would have taken. So that would have been, as I said, privately made, holes strung up, wires strung up, and uh, 
they connect with two buildings, probably just with a simple magneto, and um, you bring it the other end and they communicate with each other. And that reference there, that, that one sentence, is the only reference I can find to that telephone number. So. Now in 1884, Dr. Popham, um, which is the son of the cannon firing Dr. Popham, um, this is another Dr. Popham, he was campaigning for the telephone service to be brought to Gawler. And he had a very long battle with Charles Todd. You can see it lasted a good five years. Um, because it was all about economics and the price of this. And the price of you know, the cost of stringing a cable from Adelaide to Gawler at the time. And uh, in the end, the final negotiation came down that uh, they, uh, Todd asked the citizens of the town to guarantee £125 of income per annum uh, as a result of connecting the towns. Dr. Popper and James Martin finally guaranteed that they would be paid, and that's a minimum. And uh, so in 1889, well, 1888, they made arrangements to connect the telephone, and it was finally connected in 1889. Here I have a couple of pictures um, from postcards probably about, probably about 15 years after the actual connection was, was made. But here we can see Adelaide Road clearly with the string of telephone poles along the footpath there. And the front of the post office here. So you'll notice those poles don't have too many spars on them. So let's say this is the telephone pole coming in from the south. The telegraph lines actually came in from the west through the parklands and up Todd Street and then across to Murray Street. And you can see here's the telegraph pole here with far more spars and insulators on the top and both of them going into the old post office building on Murray Street from there. And uh, that was much the case for a good many years afterwards. Now the official opening in the connection was on 19th of February 1889 and it opened with just three subscribers. You know, the deal they arranged with the Postmaster General's department was that for £25 per year, it's still a lot of money in 1889, they would get a connection and free calls. So all the calls were covered by these £25. And interestingly, there was just three subscribers when they came up, and Dr. Popham actually was not one of them, even though he arranged to have this guarantee of £125 a year uh, with James Martin. So, so we have the flour millers, the general store, and the foundries, probably the three biggest businesses in Gora at the time. The telephone exchange was placed in the, uh, this particular building, and we know now it's a flower shop, but if you walk in the flower shop in the front door, immediately to your right in that corner, that was where the first telephone exchange was set. And you will recall that uh, switchboard that was on an earlier slide would have been sat in that particular corner and I think for about the first 24 years it would have been operated by one of the clerks, one of the telegraph staff or one of the postal assistants. There was no dedicated telephonist as we know them um, operating that particular exchange and when there was only three lines it probably wasn't going to be a great onerous amount of work anyway. It would make sense. Now I've got three pictures here of that building and the interesting point here is that this early picture shows the door, and as we picture the building with the three arches in the front, the door was in the central arch. And of course, that's no longer the case. The door is in the right-hand arch. And the middle picture actually shows two doors. They're in the central arch and the right-hand arch, so just, just here. And that came about in 1915, when they actually effectively built an entrance and an exit in, in the post office building. And then at a later time, which I've yet to determine, they filled that in, and so the right hand floor was the, the only one where it remains today. Uh, the photo on the right, on your right, also shows a telephone box at the front. That was installed about 1922. There was also plans to have another telephone inside that little area underneath the clock tower, uh, which is where the public book uh, exchange is now. Uh, that, they, they actually did have a telephone in there for a while, so they had two public telephones in that building in front of it for quite a number of years. Um, so here we have here alterations of the building in 1901, um, converted the telephone room to an exchange, 
and in further alterations in 1915, which actually saw the post office move out of that building temporarily and then came back when the alterations were done with several of those major works. And they created a new telephone exchange on the south side of the building instead of by the front door. So, a few random facts about the telephone in its early days. There was a chess match, Ch big things chess matches, and uh, those, those involved in some of the recent Charles Todd talks would have heard about tele telegraphic chess matches. So here's the first telephone match, the first telephone chess match which was played against the Highmarsh Club, reputed to be the first in Australia. So, something of an achievement. And uh, nine simultaneous games were commenced at 8 pm. So this was a case of the staff using the facilities after hours. And at 2 a.m. the score was one win, one loss, with seven unfinished games. And at 2 a.m. they abandoned it and went home to bed. <laughs> so um, they were keen. Let's just say they were keen. Right. August 1889, a public telephone booth was opened at the railway station. And the calls were sixpence per five minutes. That's for the general public and a shilling for a five minute call to Adelaide, Port Adelaide. I should mention they were the same rates that you could from the public telephone that was part of the Gawler Post Office telephone exchange as well. Um, a couple of years later, we've grown from three subscribers to nine subscribers, and we see now that Dr. Potton is, is one of them. Uh, May Brothers have joined it, the other foundry, Pierce, Wincy & Co, another general store, uh, the police station, the railway telegraph office, another flour mill, uh, join the original three. So, um, still a good deal, £25 a year, free calls. And, um, and as I said, for the locals, they could go to the post office and make a call. And I think Dr. Popham um, also offered that people could actually go to his rooms and make a phone call from his rooms if they needed to. Now, with those um, nine subscribers, uh, people who wanted to make a phone call to Adelaide, and of course Adelaide was subscribers in Adelaide were growing quite greatly, uh, they found that they had to wait to get connected to these calls. And because these uh, telephone calls for the nine subscribers were not charged by the minute, but they could stay on them for ages because it didn't really matter. So what they found then was that by the early 1890s, people were complaining about how long it took to make, get connected for a call. And so they, they then actually started going back to using the telegraph and going back to using the post to send their messages to Adelaide and get replies back. Because remember, at the time, you could send a letter to Adelaide in the morning and get a reply back in the afternoon. So, you know, and, and that was sort of tuppence each way versus sixpence for one phone call. So it was still cheaper. Right, in the early 1890s, because of these complaints, uh, Charles Todd actually had promised that he would put up a second line, but once again wanted some guarantee. The people of Gora wouldn't give that guarantee, so he just didn't do it. And then uh, he also, they tried to work out a technical method of actually multiplexing calls, having multiple calls on the same wire, uh, which is quite a common practice nowadays. Um, but there was a, another unfulfilled promise. So that went through. And the subscribers decreased. They even dropped the rate down to £15 a year, free calls still, still decreased, they still weren't happy, and it was still probably cheaper to send a letter and get a reply back that afternoon. So in 1907, we are still only up to 28 subscribers, um, but 4,000 calls were made from the public telephone box in that one year, which is a good number of calls, and that got a bit of use. Now, of course, by 1907, of course, the Postmaster General's Department was now a Commonwealth Department, a state department. So all these private deals that were made by Charles Todd uh, sort of all got overtaken by the Commonwealth and it was left to people in Melbourne to tell the people of Gawler, tough luck, you can't have that special deal anymore. You get the same rate as everyone else in Australia because it's not fair. And from 1908, they then paid an annual rental and then had to pay for every phone call. And so we see there, phone calls dropped from 300 a day to 45. So I think clearly didn't like that. <laughs> um, in 1913, a letter appeared in the Bunyip. Um, now, I should mention that in 1912, the service became a continuous service, and they put on an official telephonist in 1912. 
1913, you can imagine where that spot was in the front, by the front door. Uh, this was a description. Uh, the room is inadequate for the purpose which it is asked to serve, being placed in such a position that conversations can be overheard by people in the post office. Now this is clear because they just put up some sheets of board, cut the holes in it for a bit of ventilation, and everybody could hear what was being said. And we go back to those concerts, probably could also hear what was being said at the other end of the call. Uh, and it is with difficulty that one can hear when many folk are awaiting attention in the next room. So problems with the noise coming back and interrupting the call. Uh, the large windows left into the street wall permits the sun to stream down on the already heated person of the attendant. Because this is the west wall. There's no veranda on that post office, remember? And so they get the full impact of the sun in the summer and they get the full impact of the southwesterlies in winter. So it was a hot place or a cold place and really nothing in between. Um, an apology for a shield is a thin window blind which is drawn more through force of habit than from any benefit derived. So this is 1913. Um, the Gawler Council takes up the, the mantle to try and get things done and they continue to um, barter with the post office, and barter with the federal MPs uh, to have this done, but it was not until 1915 that many was actually done. So, as I said, we're a tiny 12, 24 hour service, and um, after 1915, uh, further changes were in 1925 when they increased it, the size of the telephone exchange because they were getting more subscribers. And I think they increased the staff from one to two. So, not, not many people didn't think about it. Right, in the 1930s, telephone exchanges were getting a bit congested with all the subscribers coming through. So, we were using technology that was 20, 30, 40 years old, and so the post office looked to develop new exchanges and new means of sort of bypassing some of the busy exchanges. So a decision was made to build a repeater station at Gawler. So that's a station which receives a call, then boosts the signal to forward it to another place. And that was part of this plan to relieve congestion in Adelaide. Um, this also can coincide with the trunk lines, the phone lines which were previously on poles running up and down the Glen North Road, um, to put them underground. And of course, at that time, Salisbury was developing. Uh, still too early for Elizabeth, but uh, that was to come after the war. And a new repeater station was built in High Street in 1939, and part of that building is part of the existing, post, uh, the existing telephone exchange now. And then in 1940, when the repeater station was built, they moved the telephone exchange to the first floor of the post office so that cables could connect directly, sort of straight out the back window into the new repeater station on High Street behind it. And there is the first building, the first repeater station, a lot smaller than the building that's there now, but you can clearly see that it's much, much the same facade as what we have now. And lots of, gap, lots of space between that building on High Street and the post office building behind it. Now, oh, so I should go back there, you know, you know, in, the, in the late 40s, um, they decided to increase the size of the repeat building, and they basically filled in that space behind the building between it and the post office. Now, in their 50s, um, we have in 1956, Gawler had 26 telephonists and 769 subscribers. Now, how about these clippings from the bunker in the early 50s tell us that um, its capacity had been reached there, and we put in here at the, um, uh, the technical school in Murray Street, um, which is basically the building next to it, <laughs> um, was having troubles getting a phone connected, and there were rumours then of a two year wait to get a telephone installed in Gawler. So they went on and uh, they decided uh, to put in new switchboards and convert the old switchboards from the magneto ones that they wound up to battery operated ones with electricity power phones. And that occurred in 1956 and there we have the report on the changeover. So a lot of lobbying got rid of that two year wait. So here we have the larger telephone exchange with the building extended at the back. And then in the 1960s, they decided to automate the telephone exchange and take it out of the first floor of the post office and put it into the same building. 
And the way they did that was quite interesting. What they basically did was took the roof off the building, filled in all the side windows, and built another floor on top. So there you can see the original roof being jacked up. They'd lay a course of bricks, jack it up a bit more, lay a course of bricks, jack it up a bit more, lay a course of bricks, and <coughs> so that built the floor on top of the repeater station. So now we have the telephone exchange and the repeater station in the same building, and that's still the case today. The new exchange, automated exchange, was installed in 1967, uh, after the building was being built, and opened in 1968. So here we have some photographs of some of the work and the internal workings of that uh, building. Here in 1968, we think this photograph, this photograph may actually be taken on the last day of the exchange. It's, it's pretty close to that period uh, when we had all of these operators connecting to the course. And when they converted to the new exchange, I won't say all of the operators lost their jobs. Some of them were redeployed. Some of them jumped ship before because they, they thought they might get sacked. Um, but they did retain some of these switchboards uh, for manually assisted calls and uh, telephone inquiries, 013 calls, international calls. So there was still a need for telephonists, even though all of the local calls had become automated. Of course, if you're asking your customers now to dial the telephone number instead of picking up the phone and the operator would say, number please, and they'd connect you. Everyone in Gordon got a new phone. So all the old wind-up phones, the Siemens phones, the candle sticks, uh, all, all chucked in the bin. And everyone got one of, a choice of one of these, or a, sort of a, a modern sort of a candle stick-like phone in the new flash colours in the 1960s. And everybody got a telephone book. First time a telephone directory had been issued. So that came out, it's only about 12 pages. And here we have all the dignitaries going through the exchange when it opened in May 1968. And of course, the public had to be taught all the new methods. And we have then still who remember STD calls when STD meant something else, but uh, of some people will tell you nowadays you can get it from the phone. Um, <laughs> so this was the instructions on how to make a long distance call uh, with all the prefixes in the front. Um, they actually set up in what was the old cinema, which is the building there on the corner of uh, Kelvin Street and uh, Murray Street there, a uh, customer information centre uh, where they would give demonstrations and teach people uh, how everything worked. And uh, the lady there is uh, Howard Marsh's daughter. Um, as time progressed, they tried to get everyone, you know, everyone to do more of their own work so that they didn't have to employ staff to do their own do the work for them. So as more and more country exchanges got converted to automatic, people could then dial them directly, so they didn't need the telephonists to connect them. So locally we get Gawler River and Roseworthy and Wasleys and Freeling and Hamley Bridge all get converted to automatic exchanges and then Gawler can uh, Gawler people could ring them directly. And then the next, of course, development of that was the overseas phone calls. Uh, I've got some varying, conflicting dates on when each of these started, but it may just relate to different exchanges. But overseas calls, um, I've got one that tells me 1977 was when people could make their own overseas calls, but this advertisement is from 1973, so I'm to suggest that's a bit earlier. Now, Jumped a little bit. The reason I jumped a little bit is because back in May, I've been going through the bunyips each week, and back in May I don't got up to 1977. <laughs> it's like a bit of a gap. Um, but thankfully, I learned that the exchange closed in 1991, and of course we had the centenary in 1989. So I jumped a bit to get the ending, uh, but there's a few bits in between which I've yet to do. So here we have this, you know, the, the centenary. The next one was a closure. Can you go back and make two slides? Yeah, that one there. Thank you. Right. Yeah, so in mid-1990, the uh, telephonists at this stage, there were still some telephonists. Uh, this time, this was called a, a manual... Um, uh, thank you to manual assistance centre, that's right. Thank you. And uh, uh, 
these were the staff at that centre at the time, still dealing with 013 calls, directory assistance, and all those sorts of things. So it's still a good number of people. And uh, uh, telecom, as it was then, was threatened to close it down. And the staff then threatened to go on strike. They got a petition. They got a petition up uh, to try and save the uh, manual assistance centre. And uh, in two weeks, they got nearly 3,000 signatures to uh, save their centre. But sadly, it all came to no avail. But we did learn at the reunion um, through Mary, who I see you in the crowd today, um, that they, they managed to negotiate some really good packages for the people who were affected by this decision and created some precedents in Telstra. So, sadly, 3rd of January 1991, the assistance centre was closed down. Now, that was basically the presentation that I gave back in May in the phone reunion to the people who were attended. And harking back to the timers reunion when everybody ate the scones and went home, well, I thought, how can I get people to share what they did? So I uh, imposed on my old employees drakes and they put the hard work on Cadbury's. So I came up with a big bag of blocks of chocolate and basically said, you want a block of chocolate? Tell us a story. And that's what we did. <laughs> and I think, I think it was actually quite successful. So don't panic at that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was back in May. So we thought that well, what sort of information is, is crucial to learn about the telephone exchange and all their employees? So I broke it down into a few sections and I'll just get through these fairly quickly. So first of all we asked them to describe the jobs that they did at the exchange from the telephonist to the linemen, the technicians and the exchange operators, the exchange technicians. Now if you want to um, Set yourself a difficult task, try and find photographs of early telephonists. Uh, search on the state web, uh, library's website with our photo collection, turned up four. Four, <laughs> only four. Uh, this lady was actually a new lipper. And I think they had a couple of pictures of semaphore and a picture of an Adelaide telephonist who went up to the River Murray in 1956 to help out after the floods. So pictures of telephonists are scarce things um, from anywhere, it seems. Uh, and people got up and did describe some of the jobs they got. got walked off with a block of chocolate each, so that was good. How did you get your job? It was another thing. Um, telephonists, technicians, they're all employed by the public service. Uh, they had examinations for all of these jobs. And here we can see this is a bunny pad, basically to say that the telephonist exam was coming up because they anticipated they would need so many telephonists in the foreseeable future and they would hold ex exams and people would sit for them and uh, be successful. They could be offered a job at the exchange at, at Gorda or indeed a, another exchange once they, they pass an exam. Now, there are a lot of people that I have names who tell me they were telephonists and I cannot find any, I cannot find whether if in fact they sat an exam. And the tales that were related to the, the, the reunion were, well, my sister got me the job or I knew Harold Marsh and he got me the job. So whether they actually ever sat an exam, I don't know. But, uh, they don't, their results don't appear in the government gazettes if they did. So. Um, telephonist was also so low on the public service scale, it, it didn't even rate for many, many years. And, uh, uh, so that may be another reason why perhaps the examination wasn't um, absolutely required. Right, so what qualifications did you need? Um, the exams were basically sort of almost a diction, comprehension test and an arithmetic test and almost a test of you know your speaking voice, your listening voice and those sorts of things. Yeah. And I, when I was researching for the reunion I found this little biography from a lady who lives in Elizabeth who, as you can read here, she came to Australia in 56, 17 year old single girl from Leeds and uh, she went for a job as a, a trainee at the PMG's department to be a switchboard operator and she had to take classes at the Gawler Institute to learn how to speak, uh, in, uh, learn to speak Australian. <laughs> so here's an English lass going to the coming to the institute to speak, learn how to speak Australian. So I thought, I thought it was a, you know, a, a good comment on the day. Uh, I also asked what were the best and worst parts of the jobs. All right, so that, that brought a few tales I can tell you. Um, imagine being a lineman. 
sort of squeezing all between all the, the cables on those poles, and those poles were you know, some of them quite high. Some of, some of them actually tied three ladders end to end to climb up to the top. So, you know, no and s was nothing in those days. Um, I was told that there was actually a deliberate gap in the centre of the pole, so they could actually get up there between, between the wires and, and reconnect things. Uh, the other picture here is someone winding the clock, because in Gawler, the most junior person usually got the job of having to climb up the tower and wind up the clock. And that was done by post office staff, and I'm sure Ray Hicks, he will tell you that he's, he's done that job. Um, when the post office moved out, uh, the uh, exchange technicians did it, and I believe now it's done by volunteers for the corporate council. So they get the volunteers to do it because they, they don't have the same OHS obligations as well stuff. That's not true. Not true. I knew I did it right. <laughs> right, so having got a job there, of course we have a situation that people can get promoted up the scales, they can get transferred to different places, and they can get trained up for other jobs. So we asked about some of those. Uh, still a little bit of uh, you know keeping me in the family was, was going on as well. Uh, we have a couple of story there. Uh, Pauline Day and uh, was was one. Pauline was there on, in back in May. Um, Pauline was basically asked. Well, they, they just asked the girls at the Telephone Exchange, anybody fancy working out in the springs? And she innocently said yes, and ended up there for a few years. So, um, so on, on the transfer. Uh, the other thing that they also did was actually um, train students in Mangala High at how to use telephone equipment. So not necessarily for a job with the PMG Department of Telecom, but even just in the general office. Because a lot of the telephonists were switchboard operators and they could also get jobs in large office blocks and factories um, using the same equipment. Memorable incidents. A few of these came up along the day. Um, two of the most significant ones were um, responding to emergencies, floods and bushfires uh, was, was one. And quite often the girls in exchange would be asked just to keep working on, um, often without pay, do a double shift, no pay, um, just really to keep the emergency services <coughs> happening. And um, there were some, some wonderful stories came out from that. It seems the most memorable days in telephone history here was um, Christmas Day 1974, Cyclone Tracy just obliterated Darwin and of course everybody was trying to find out what, what had happened in Darwin, if they had family and friends in Darwin. And another big incident happened when there was a huge torrential cloud burst on Calton Hill and all the water ran down the hill and flooded the exchange and the switchboard lit up <laughs> uh, through electric shocks and the like as the circuits short circuited. So all these come up there. Uh, Val the Storm had told a very interesting story about uh, being in the exchange on one of these uh, fire uh, overtime situations. And remember, West Wall on a hot summer's day, sultry as anything, she said, I just couldn't stand it anymore. And all that's left is stripped down to their bra and pants and they're <laughs> operating in <laughs> exchange like that. When a fairly prominent senior male citizen of the town of walked in on them. I've, che I've checked with Bruce, he doesn't remember it. <laughs> 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 so for someone with a, with a razor sharp memory, he, he's excised that. <laughs> uh, we asked them for funny stories. And then other things that they did. Now the, quiz, the quizzes evolved in Queensland in the late 1940s and the PMG's department was so impressed with what Queensland did, it grew to be a, a national competition and they would have state competitions to get a state champion and then they would all compete for national and thing. And uh, these quizzes were actually held like those old seances were, so that all the, the staff at the Gawler Exchange would be at Gawler and they'd have the quiz master asking them questions from Adelaide. So, yeah. so um, I only found these details of where, where they came runners up or won the state but didn't win the competition. I was told in a later quiz they did actually win and uh, I've been I'm told there is a photograph of that winning team, but I've got a track going on down. But so, so that's certainly something that needs to be included in, the, in this history. So, um, Harold Marsh's two daughters featured heavily in these quiz teams, 
and uh, one of those ladies in the picture there is a Geraldine Noah Colin Tom is actually still working for Telstra. Uh, so, yes, she got well into her 70s. <laughs> yes. Right. The end thing in the 50s, 60s and 70s, of course, was, was uh, quests. Um, all of the service groups used to run quests, um, <coughs> quests, which were generally charity raising quests, let's face it, they were all charity raising. Uh, the Postal Institute also ran a quest, and there was a missed post office as well. And so here are some of the Gawler you know, contestants in those quests. Um, Pam Sneedsby, now Pam Cleland, who was turned up on the day. Um, Joan Woolock um, is there. Sally Garden also turned up at the reunion as well. And so they were all there. And uh, you can see that some of them raised considerable amounts of money and did very well. And social life. Uh, and Anne wasn't in the room when I brought this up, and all of her friends laughed and she wasn't there. <laughs> this is Anne and her husband Gary, who got married in 1968. Now, now up, up until 1966, when a lady was married, she was effectively retired from the public service. Okay, so there were very few married women. They could get exceptions, and they could also get temporary work, which you often did to cover holidays and things like that. So here's a bit from the Public Service Act. Uh, the employment of married women in the service is deemed undesirable. <laughs> but if any special case it should be considered advisable to depart from this law, employment may be sanctioned on the recommendation of the permanent head. So they had to go pretty high up to get a permission to continue working when they were married. And uh, so basically when they got married, if they'd been in the service five to eight years, they, they got one month's leave, over eight years, two months leave, you know, if they'd been there for over 12 years, they got three months leave, and when that leave was finished, they were effectively retired. So no matter, no matter the age, they were retired. So this was, re, this was actually one of the uh, election issues. And in 1966, um, the, the Holt government repealed that particular section from the Public Service Act in October 66, um, so that married women can then continue to have their job. And equal pay took another seven years after that. Now, I say equal pay for telephonists, in the early 1970s, I think the 73 annual report said that uh, telephonists were 96% female, 4% male. So I don't think he could play that too much there. Uh, the um, post, the uh, Arsenal General's Department also had a sort of a social club and a training centre known as the Postal Institute, uh, later the Post Tel Institute. And Gawler had its own branch of the Postal Institute. And they filled the teams in local sports competitions, they, they ran events. Um, many of the staff interacted with Gordas community, and that's one of the aspects I'm trying to draw out in my post office history, is that interaction with, with the community. So this was a double page spread that featured in the Postal Institute's house magazine in 1966. And as I said, what else did they do? Brian Cleveland is into ham radio, he's still into ham radio. Um, there. Sally Garner there, who's one of the Quest contestants, um, later told us that that photograph was particularly taken because she was at the time also in the Miss South Australia Quest. So that coincided with that. And uh, Robert Mulholland, a uh, famous Central Districts player, actually was, a, was a, an Irish immigrant who came to Gawler, grew up in Gawler, and uh, was quite prominent in uh, the local football and tennis scene. Now, the other thing about this reunion for me was to draw stuff out. So even before the reunion was held, I was sent this photograph here of a, some social event, the, the telephonists. Um, now, at the start, three of these I couldn't identify, or weren't able to be identified by the lady who sent it. Uh, the lady who sent it was Janice Greeley, as the one on your far right there. So some sort of a social event. Uh, it was sort of the latter half of the 1950s. Now, I managed to work out because I've seen some of these ladies when they got appointed and when they retired or resigned. So I've narrowed it down now to 56 to 58. Um, but three of those ladies all passed their exam on the same day. So I'm just wondering if there might be a celebration of the three of them passing their exam on the same day. So, so 
So that was a great car up there in all the 1950s finery. Um, with the promotion for the reunion, the Bunny, I've got to say, Bunny did a wonderful job. And this was the, the time of the new editor, and everyone was a bit uh, nervous about how the new editor would take the Bunny. So Anne and I arranged uh, to speak to the local reporter. We had a full page. I think it was quite remarkable for promote a reunion. And then two weeks later, there were five photographs of them from the reunion um, of, of people who attended. So the Bunyip did us proud. Did us. Um, some of the speakers on the day who got up to tell their tale and to sing for their supper or a block of Cadbury's. <laughs> <laughs> And they were quite enthusiastic about it all. Now, it also brought in a lot of memorabilia. Um, and so these were things that people brought on the day. So, in fact, we, I think we got about four photo albums were brought in, um, in lots of bits of memorabilia. Um, the, the, um, the National Trust and myself, we've scanned all of those. So we've increased our photo collection of the telephone exchange by nearly 200 photographs. So quite remarkable. So it's really worthwhile. And uh, this is a, a Josephine Bullock in Miss Post Office Quest. So that's uh, here on the left. And uh, with a lady um, who was a monitor. You know, a monitor was like the supervisor of the girls in the exchange. That's Dorothy Martin. Uh, who's one of the unidentified ladies in the other photo, so we will to do that. I'm presuming she was her chaperone at the event at the way at Centennial Hall. Uh, Josephine came to the reunion as well. Uh, these are some of the things that were brought on the day. Now, the most significant thing, of course, is this switchboard. About a month before the reunion, the uh, guys at the National Trust say, Oh, we've been invited up to Mount Alab. Oh, they, they, actually, they, they're going on trips to different um, National Trust museums. And they, they went to the Mount Alab Museum and they saw this switchboard out in the shed and they asked, well, what's, what are you going to do with that? Because the museum already had a switchboard in it. And they basically said, well, we're going to dump it. We've got one in the museum, we don't need two, we're going to dump it. So the guys grabbed it. And so that's now in the back of the National Trust and they've been cleaning it up. They actually brought it into the Gawler Institute, which was we thought would be a major logistical exercise, but they managed to do it quite neatly. And uh, when they took it back to the National Trust, they took it on the pallet jack and moved it on the footpath. <laughs> so I wish we got a photograph of that. <laughs> so, uh, so that was on display. Brought back a lot of memories for, for people there because it was the same type as it was used in Gawler. And some of the small knickknacks and things that people brought along. Uh, there's a photograph of the football team which I'm told is the only football match played by Gawler members of the Postal Institute. And they played one game, I'm told, and that's the team. Is that uh, a No. <laughs> 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 and uh, some more photographs. Most of the photographs were, a lot of them, I'll say, a lot of them that came in were, were, were technical things, which would really bore you tonight. Um, and social events and retirements and Christmas parties and things like that. Apparently every payday they'd knock off early and have a barbecue in the backyard of the exchange. So uh, there's photographs of that, but I thought, well, we'll, we'll leave guilty guilty and uh, nobody need know. Now, ongoing research, as I mentioned before, I'm still going through the bunyips in May. I was only up to 1977. I just finished 1985, so I'm still working through them. Um, so. Uh, we're finding more stories, um, safety award presentations there. Uh, this was for, uh, at this point, uh, 122,000 man hours without an accident. It's not a, not a bad record for an exchange. And um, some of the memorabilia that came back in was a whole collection of certificates for these safety awards, and so that pairs, pair, pairs them up quite nicely. Um, more, more things from the Bunyip about the business office that was open in Brandash Court. Brandash Court is that little arcade thing that runs uh, on Murray Street opposite the post office, the old post office building. So that ran in there. And of course, about three years after that, they opened one in the Northern Market Centre where the Telstra shop mm -hmm. operates from. That's there. And of course, um, by about 1985, which is the job advertisement there, a telephonist has now changed to become known as a manual assistance one. So it's 
sort of dehumanises it a bit, I think, but um, that's what they did. And it was just a little competition there um, to win a, a beeper. A beeper was a telecom mascot of the day, and a, a prize winner there um, from the manager of the business centre. Now, we did ask the question, had there been any other reunions of the, of the staff? And apparently there had been a few after the 1991 closure, but as I was going through the budgets, uh, we turned up that there was basically biannual reunions being held from 1979. So these this is from 79, 81 and 85, I think these stories are from. But they do give us a good list of names of all the attendees. And there's a lot of well-known baller names among them. And I think some of these also came to the one in May. So if they've got photographs of these events, I've got to see those. And for myself, I'm still going through the, government, the Commonwealth Government Gazette. It's now all online. Oh, gee, it takes some working out. <laughs> it really does. Um, I think I've finally cracked it. And I can now tell you that Gorda's first telephonist was a lady called Elsa Schneider, who was um, appointed in 1912. So probably when they began the 24-hour service, so she would have done the day shift and one of the junior boys would have done the night shift and uh, she was there until about 1915 and a lady called Edna Berg was, was the telephonist. Uh, she was actually from Adelaide so she was only here for two years and then she went back to Adelaide and then got uh, and then was sadly killed in a car crash, joyriding with her boyfriend, so one of, one of the state's earliest victims of a car crash. And it was generally just a single telephonist through her 20s, and then it became two, and then it became three, and then it became four, and as we saw, it became 26 in the 1950s. And uh, was a, a pretty large employer of you know, young females in the town um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. So, so the other things we get from the, the gazettes are the staffing levels. So every position had to have a staff, an official public service staffing level, so that would tell you how many telephonists were allowed to be in Gorda, the like. Uh, the examinations that they took, um, and then of course transfers, promotions, resignations, and tenders for buildings. So there's a lot of information in there, but it, it's, it's a real hard slot to get through. It really, really, really is. So we were suggesting next year we do one for the post office staff. So, Ray Hicks. Who's, who's with us here today? <laughs> Ray Hicks on his bike, and Ray Hicks um, was promoted to a scooter. <laughs> there. And I would love to know about Brian Purdy, who was voted in 1973 as the Playboy of the Year. Oh. <laughs> I cannot find out anything about that competition, but so. As I said, Gorda's post office history keeps turning out really fascinating tidbits. That's just one of them. You know, so we had a Playboy of the Year version of the post office. So, so that's, that's what's coming up for November next year. So, thank you.